So now to our main program, we're going to have um, our incoming VP of Service, Jimmy Collins, introduce our main program. Just a couple of facts about Jimmy before he comes up. So Jimmy, if you didn't know this, recently co-authored a history of the Army Reserve at Fort Lawton for the Magnolia Historical Society. Also, he and his wife, Linda, will be touring northern Italy in the fall, presumably without your three grandchildren, right? OK, come on up, Jimmy. Thanks very much, uh, Cindy. I appreciate that uh, short introduction. You know, uh, June is a great month to hear from your army. The, two, the 244th birthday occurs a week from Friday on June 14th. The Army's Meet Your Army initiative that is helping uh, urban communities get connected uh, to the Army uh, will culminate here in Seattle with the Seafair Festival activities in uh, late July and early August. And uh, you get the opportunity today to learn about the Army locally and internationally from our very own member, Lieutenant General Gary uh, Valesky. But before I introduce him, I want to extend an invitation from General Valesky and your Army. Uh, those, there are several of you here who have taken advantage of the opportunity to go to JBLM. I, I see uh, Paul Ishi and uh, Paula Houston. I know you've had dinner there at the at the commander's quarters. Many of you have taken the bus ride uh, to JBLM to learn about what the Army and Air Force does there. Uh, your next opportunity is the 4th of July. And you have this colorful flyer on your table, so I'll tell you now during the program so you can, uh, I know you'll want to pay good close attention to General Valesky, but before, before you leave, we'd like for you to opt in. And the ways to do that, this less glamorous looking form uh, is also on your table. If you want an invitation which gives you the details, then we'll need your name, your email address, and your phone number as a minimum. And you can either give them to me or you can leave them on the table and I'll pick them up. Or if you've run out of tables uh, of flyers at your table, certainly you can give me your card. But you do need to opt in. Lieutenant General Gary Valesky was born in Spokane. He graduated from Eastern Washington University in, uh, uh, you know, with uh, uh, at the same time being an ROTC graduate, and that kicked off his uh, his life. He met his wife Leanne at uh, ROTC summer camp. They were uh, uh, cadets together and have been bonded uh, ever since. They have one son. Leanne is from Yakima, so this is a this is a, a Washington family. I'll tell you, General Valesky is a fierce warrior if you're an opponent. Uh, he's one really good fellow if you're on his team, and I know you'll enjoy hearing from him. General Valesky. Well, good afternoon, and thank you for inviting me to be able to share a little bit of time and tell you about your great soldiers that live and work at JBLM when they're not deployed defending our freedom. People have asked me why I've stayed in for 35 years. And if, you're, if, if you have served, please stand up. If you've served, please stand up. They are the reason that I stay in the Army. And I, I, I do that to tell you those great veterans that have served, we stand on your shoulders to continue to set the nation on the path that you've set us during your outstanding service. So about the next. 15 minutes, I'd just like to tell you that a little bit about Joint Base Lewis McCord and let you know that it's not just six exits south of Tacoma <laughs> that blocks traffic going to DuPont. <laughs> Even though there are 50,000 people that work and contribute $8 billion to the Washington economy, which is more than the UN peacekeeping annual budget is, or more than Netflix pays every year for original content, <laughs> there are uh, soldiers and airmen on Joint Base Lewis McCord that defend our freedom every single day. So next slide, if you would. Now, in true Army tradition, I'm going to kill you with a number of PowerPoints, but what I promise is we're just putting pictures up there today because you're not in uniform and, and you don't have pencils to stick in your own eyes as we talk about this. <laughs> but, but let me tell you a little bit about America's First Corps. We, just, we are the oldest corps in the Army, just celebrated our 100-year anniversary, and many of you know it's the 75th anniversary of D-Day in Normandy. Uh, it's also the 75th anniversary of the end of the New Guinea campaign that America's first corps fought in the Pacific. We've been tied as a Pacific 
uh, unit uh, really since World War II. Even though we uh, celebrate our 100-year anniversary last year, we, our patch goes back to the Civil War. So if you've come to the Corps' headquarters, I'd encourage you to look at the great, great rich history of the Corps. So you can see on the top line all of those campaigns. Even though we are assigned to the Pacific, uh, we have soldiers that deploy to Iraq and Afghanistan every year. So when we talk about what the mission of America's First Corps is, really regional engagement in the Pacific to continue to build alliances and partnerships as well as interoperability with all those key partners and allies in the Pacific, but be ready when called to go anywhere to deploy, fight, and win. What makes us unique in uh, the Corps is we're the only Corps that has soldiers stationed or assigned us that are not stationed in the continental United States. So the other two Corps in Fort Hood and at Fort Bragg, their units are all in the United States. We have a division at Joint Base Lewis McCord, but we also have a division in Hawaii, and we have a two-star headquarters in Alaska. That gives us the opportunity to train in environments that no other units in our Army can do that. And so I just tell you, for example, we sent a company from Hawaii in November to Alaska. And we just sent a company from Alaska who's currently in Hawaii doing an exercise right now. So when I went and visited the, the uh, folks in Alaska in November, I saw a first sergeant who came from Charlottesville, North Carolina, or that might be South Carolina. I'm from Washington, I don't know. <laughs> it's not important to me. <laughs> who had never seen snow. And there he was building an Accio and pulling a sled with his soldiers through the, through the snow, and w which was a balmy 29 degrees. And so now we've got uh, them, the Alaska contingent in Hawaii right now in the jungles. So we, we're pretty excited about what we get to do every day and the unique uh, contributions that America Corps makes to our Army every day. Next uh, slide. So we talk a little bit about what our mission is, and it's really first and primarily uh, to conduct regional engagements with our partners in the Pacific to build interoperability, assure our allies that we're with them, and then, as I said, to deploy, fight, and win. What makes us special are those things that you see in each of those pictures, and those are the men and women of our Army, the less than 1% of our nation that has raised their right hand to serve. And when you talk to them uh, and say, why did you serve? You'll hear the typical, well, I didn't know what I wanted to do after high school. I really wanted to get a college education. That lasts for about six months. And then when you ask them, they say, I wanted to be part of something bigger than I, than I am. I wanted to be part of a team. And the only reason we can do what we do is because of the great men and women on that picture right there. And so I tell you, as you go and see soldiers, uh, understand that, that they are, in my mind, a special breed. And it isn't just soldiers. It's our airmen, it's our sailors, it's our Marines, it's our Coast Guardsmen. But that's what we do every day. And those are some of the pictures of some of the engagements we've done throughout the Pacific. Next slide. So if you looked at the, um, the, this picture, you know, you've heard a lot over the last you know, two years about a free and open Indo-Pacific. And what I want to do is just highlight that circle, if you can see it on this side, that big circle right there, and just tell you a little bit about that circle and why it's so important globally. Inside that circle, more people live inside that circle than outside that circle. One third of the, gro the world's gross domestic product is generated in that circle. More things physically and virtually pass through that circle than anywhere in the world. 13% of the United States gross domestic product is generated in that circle, which equals, you know, probably about $2.6 trillion worth of ec economic uh, activity for the United States. So that's why it's important to the world. In the, in the military, we have a term called key terrain, and I just highlight that little red line there called the Strait of Malacca. Key terrain to us is if you own it, you have an advantage, or it's so important to your operation that you must consider its impact and the, sta the state that it's in. So the Strait of Malacca, it's the second busiest waterway in the world. Over half of all of the tonnage moved by sea goes through that strait. And if it were shut down for one week, it would cost $64 million in additional shipping costs. That's how important that strait is. So when you look at not only globally, but to the United States, that circle is where America's First Corps is really focused on every single day of every year. So go to the next, go to the, or no, stay right there if you would. So 
I told you the importance of that circle. Let's talk about what those pictures on the, the right-hand side. If you looked at our national security strategy that was published 18 months ago, we talk about five concerns, really China, North Korea, Iran, Russia, and violent extremists. If you look there, four of those, uh, of those are on this, in this circle or in the vicinity of that circle. So the gentleman up top, KJU, I'd never been to Korea in 33 years. My wife, as a lieutenant, went to Team Spirit, so she had all the Korea bragging rights until I took this job. I went to Korea, South Korea, five times in seven months. If you'd asked me 18 months ago, I thought I'd have been fighting on the peninsula because of the nuclear concerns we had. Clearly, the, the dynamic on the peninsula has changed, but if people ask me well, what keeps me awake at night, it is what's going on on the Korean peninsula. Uh, that lower picture, the picture next to it, the presidents of uh, China and Russia, they're meeting again this week. Uh, China is the long-term the long concern based on uh, their militarization of the South China Sea, some of their predatory economic uh, uh, practices, as well as their, their uh, you know, stealing pro uh, property or intellectual property and secrets of technology on cyber domain. Russia. You see, they're only 12 miles of border on the Pacific, but they're acting as a spoiler for the United States and everything we do. So if there's a gap, we expect Russia is going to try to fill that. That next slide, violent extremist organizations. If you look at the, you know, Iraq and Afghanistan, where I've been a time or two, we talk about violent extremist organizations and the impact they've had. People forget that in this region, a thousand, at least a thousand of those soldiers are coming back into that, into that circle. So what does violent extremism mean in that region? Well, we saw what happened in Morali. We saw what happened on Easter Sunday in Sri Lanka. Those are concerns for us in, as we conduct operations in the Pacific. And then as you look at that final slide there, you know, we are always concerned about natural disasters. 75% of the volcanoes and 90% of the earthquakes happen in that circle. And the UN has estimated that by the year you know, 2030, it's going to cost $160 billion a year in reconstruction because of natural disasters. So I saw that uh, your president has a theme that's called, I think it's action and impact on that slide. So what actions has America's first court taken and what impact are we having? So if you go to the next slide and we talk about Pacific Pathways, that is the operation that we do every year where we're putting thousands of soldiers in that circle primarily with these 11 countries, to really build those alliances and partnerships. So as I talked to you about those organizations in Hawaii, Alaska, and, and uh, JBLM, we're going to put soldiers in the Pacific for 10 months every year. We, could, we do traditional exercises with those 11 countries, but not just them, all countries that we want to build partnerships with, like Palau, who we've had a defense uh, agreement with for a number of years, for decades, to really show them that we're committed. You know, I had a a boss of mine that used to talk about virtual presence, you know, doing VTCs. He said, virtual presence is no presence. And that's what, frankly, we've been doing the last five or ten years. We've been really busy in the Middle East. We want to get busy in the Pacific. And so you're going to see over the next two or three years, America's First Corps soldiers are going to be deployed in the Pacific for a, a, a lot longer than we ever have been. And so we're pretty excited about that. Uh, I would tell you that uh, of those 11 exercises, you can see the partners that we do. This isn't just a brigade level of three or 4,000. This is the core, my headquarters. All the divisions and all the units inside of those are going to be involved in exercises there. And so uh, I would just, I just highlight that to show you that as you hear about the shift to the Pacific, while you still may hear a lot about Iraq and Afghanistan, know that those soldiers up at JBLM, that's their focus. Next slide. So, of course, I came up here and, and, and uh, had a great lunch, and a number of you have said, well, what, what can we do for you? And you heard uh, Jimmy Collins talk a little bit about, you know, Freedom Fest and soldiers. You see some of our Seattle recruiting battalion members here today. The Army has identified Seattle as one of the top 22 cities that we want to recruit in this year. And so we have a program that we call Soldier for Life. And some of you have heard this before, and it's really been focused this is about the life cycle of a soldier. So the day that Gary Valesky raised his hand and joined our army until the day they put me in the ground at Arlington, I'm a soldier. Doesn't matter if I'm wearing a uniform or I've retired, because I will retire, unfortunately, one day. 
but we're a soldier for life. And so we focused a lot on transitioning soldiers, frankly, because we had a lot of our budget that was going to pay for unemployment benefits, and we didn't do a good job transitioning our servicemen and women. We've done a lot better with a lot of help from your communities. 48% of those that retire from Joint Base Lewis McCord stay in the Seattle area and work for you. And so we think that's great because what do they bring? Leadership, initiative, responsibility, security clearances, drug free, and they've got life experience. But what we want to do now is we want to focus on the first part of that cycle, that first one to six years, and we need your help. We want to get great, great Americans to be part of that less than 1% that joins the military. And I, I say this as a soldier, but we've got the Navy represented here. We've got the Air Force at Joint Base System of Corps Marines. From my perspective, I'd love them to raise their hand and be soldiers, but we just want them to raise to serve our nation. And so we're going to ask for your help. Go to the next slide. So you say, what can I do? Well, what I'd like you to do is get to know a soldier and then get to know a future soldier and help us link those soldiers to the Army. And then what I'd like you to do is get to know a military family and then get to know that spouse because we can't do what we do without our families. I've deployed for 60 months to combat. I started my deployments when my son was three years old and went to Iraq every other year. My wife raised our son for six years. I could not do what I do without my wife and our family. And so it's not just, we say we, we, we enlist soldiers, we re-enlist re, re families. That's what I could use your help for. So if you have any questions on how to get connected, those QR codes, we'll leave those with you with those uh, emails or those links, and we'd be happy to ask for your help and answer any questions you have. So I'm ready to answer whatever questions you have, and thank you for allowing me again to speak to you today. <laughs> Or not. No, no, they're questions. Oh, that's good. <laughs> Thank you very much, General. I appreciate your comments and certainly appreciate the service of I-Corps around the world on behalf of us. Uh, my question is about the current administration has talked periodically, I'm not even sure of what the outcome have been, about changing exercises in the area you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Has the Army been affected in those conversations? And if so, how? Yeah, sure. Well, as you've read, actually, this morning there was an article about how we've reduced the scope of our exercises. And, and that's uh, exactly. I was going to what we called uh, All Chief Freedom Guardian the first year I was here, a big exercise. We're doing more uh, command post exercise now. Clearly, diplomacy is what we want to work, so we've given some space for that. It hasn't impacted our readiness to be re uh, able to deploy because we are doing other exercises uh, in conjunction with uh, other events we're doing. But um, it, we have reduced our presence out there, our exercise presence. and and. We think that's a good thing, frankly. Right here. Uh, thank you for being here and for serving our country and especially to your family as well because we often forget about all of the families behind us who help us do what we do every day. I was just curious, with all of the new range of threats that we have, both online and we were talking about you know, bioterrorism, sure. should that be a separate division? Should there be another branch to the, to the military or how is that? How would you address that considering it, it affects uh, across the board, all different branches? Yeah, and I think the question was, should we have another Space Force started us off today? Uh, I, I would just say that um, as you look at how interconnected we are, uh, we call it cross domains. So we have really five, land, air, maritime, cyber, and space. The core for our Army is leading an initiative to define how we're going to conduct multi-domain operations. So what I would say is, you know, as an Army guys, uh, Army guy, they say, okay, you're a land component, and the Navy is the maritime, and the Air Force is the air. What we have found over the last five years is we won't win that way. We have to integrate all those domains. What people don't realize is how important space is, and the Army has a huge um, responsibility to provide space architecture. So what service needs to run it? Do we need another one? I'll let the guys that make those decisions do that. But what I can tell you is, in the future, with these threats that you're talking about, we have to be much more effective in the cyber domain and the, merit and the uh, space domain. And we just con concluded an exercise called the Joint Warfighting Assessment at JBLM a month ago, where we brought all of these critical subject uh, matter experts in. And we, just, we talked about how are you going to fight a future conflict with a near peer that's got the same technology we do. 
what's that asymmetric advantage you're going to have? And what we found was exactly what you said. How do you leverage all those domains and integrate them to act faster than your adversary can? So how we're going to organize the future military to do that still remains to be seen, but uh, you, you've hit, hit the nail on the head saying that we've got to be, do things a little bit differently we're doing today that, to win. Does that answer your question? Okay. Thank you for being here. Uh, Pat Shanahan just spoke recently in Singapore. I wonder if you could comment on his speech and what the thoughts were about it. Well, it was a pretty good speech. What would you <laughs> specifically like me to comment? <laughs> I thought he did a great job, too. <laughs> He's a Secretary of Defense. Of course I agree with him. Thank you uh, so much for joining us here today. Uh, I think historically it's been proven out that uh, resource uh, acquisition has been a big driver of world conflict. And it's been fairly well documented that the military is out in front of this issue with respect to understanding climate change and its impact, yeah. regardless of some of the top sure. level messaging that's being put out there. Can you comment a bit more on your thoughts on that? And will the next world conflict be driven by water? Well, I, I, I won't go to how the next conflict will be driven, but I'll just tell you from my own experience. You know, growing up in Washington, you'll talk climate, I'll talk environment. I, when I came to JBLM, um, it was interesting to me how the, you know, we talk about pocket gophers and, and our, our birds and the rest. And to some that have not grown up in Washington State like I have, they don't get it. And uh, so I had to actually put a policy letter out that says, if you violate the environmental areas that are restricted, you're going to come see me personally. Normally when you do that, you don't have any problems when they get to come see the guy up in the head building up there. Uh, but it's a different, you know, we have, you know, when I came in the Army in 1984, we weren't talking climate. And so we've had to be able to be agile and adjust to some of these conditions. And when you go to Alaska, like I got to do, or you go to Hawaii and you get the opportunity to see different environments and, and the uh, environmental factors and the climate factors, what we have to do is make sure that we're uh, taking those into consideration for everything we do, for combat operations, for humanitarian operations. I had the opportunity to lead DOD's effort for the Ebola crisis in Liberia a few years ago. And so you want to talk about a guy that had no idea about Ebola, and then 90 days later I'm standing in Liberia talking to the president of Liberia and everyone else. It's just an example of it, it whether it's climate change, whether it's uh, uh, disease, an epidemic or whatever, your military is agile enough to, to adapt to be able to operate that in there and become and be sensitive enough to the considerations that have to be taken into account when you're operating in that environment. And we have to do that because when we operate outside the United States, those same considerations for our critical partners and allies are just as important to them. Uh, you know, when I went to Iraq, we did a lot of training in Afghanistan on dignity and respect and, and learning their culture. And what I found out uh, during my deployments was, you know, Regardless of your culture and the nuances of it, people just want to be treated with dignity and respect. Kind of the golden rule, right? So if, if we just take that piece and we apply that in our operations, we will be extremely successful and build those teams. We're never going to fight alone. We're not going to have that capability or ability to. So we have to make sure that we are tied in tightly with our allies and partners. And what you address is part of those key considerations we got to think about every day. Does that make sense? In the Pacific, um, do you have all f uh, f four or five um, branches uh, involved in those yeah. exercises? And the second part of my question is, at any given moment, how many of the troops that you have at, uh, that are based at J JBLM are here and how many of them are yeah, okay. overseas? Yeah, so the answer to your question is yes. But it's based on this, the type of the exercise. So for example, joint warfighting assessment, we had Navy representation, Air Force representation. I've got a Navy and an Air Force rep on my staff. Um, some of those exercises are much bigger, like we, we had a RIMPAC exercise a year ago where it was led by the Navy and we plugged in. We haven't done that as well in the, uh, in the past as we currently are. We got a long way to go. Um, so to get to your point, we, that is a consideration in every exercise development conference we go to, is how do we get more of our joint partners involved. 
Uh, right now, you know, I've got about 2,000 soldiers. We got almost 1,000 on the southwestern border. So I talk about the Pacific, but we got soldiers in Arizona, Texas, and the rest on the border missions. Uh, you've got them in Iraq and Afghanistan. So it really ebbs and flows. It depends. Um, you know, a year ago, I'd say we probably had, you know, three, four, five thousand deployed. This year, we've got two. It just depends on the cycle that we're going through. But what I can tell you is every single day, we have soldiers from JBLM deployed somewhere in the world. Hi, ma'am. Uh, thank you for coming today. Does the military or would the military play any role in the event of a domestic, large-scale domestic terrorist uprising? Well, I, you know, that's clearly a decision made well above mine. I mean, um, I'd, I'd have to, I'll just let, I'll let that one slide. I'm not sure I'm gonna answer that one because that, that's a decision made well above mine. But I will tell you, we'll do whatever our nation tells us to do. If you'd have told me five months ago I was gonna have a thousand soldiers on the border, I'd have said, probably not, but we are. So just so you know, whatever we're asked to do, we'll do. Even if it's against violating the Constitution, well, clearly the, we the instruction? Do yeah. Clearly oh, we would do that. And that's why I said, and, if you, and, you, can draw, yeah. you can make any scenario you want, mm -hmm. and we can always uh, pick it apart. All I'm saying is, is that we, we, will, we are prepared to do whatever our nation asks us to do. Okay, thank you. Sir, could you tell, uh, sir, could you tell us uh, some of the things that you have done to support other countries during national disasters like Fukushima? Yeah, well, you know, we did. The Army was part of Fukushima. In fact, I did an exercise down in, um, down in uh, Japan right after that was done called Yamasakura. And they were very, very obviously complimentary of the effort that the, the U.S. Army did helping them with that. We sent folks to do humanitarian assistance and disaster response. I mean, I just talked to you about Liberia when I went down there and supported the United States Aid for Air Agency for International Development on Ebola. Um, those are just two. You know, we've done uh, operations in Haiti. Uh, so it really depends on what the crisis is and who can do it. I mean, that's just the Army. If you ask the Navy, our, my Navy partners or my Marines, they're doing, you know, things in the Pacific all the time. Our, our big piece is we want to build those relationships and understand where the capability gaps are between uh, the, the services or the, or the units so that if we are asked, we already know what capabilities they need and which ones we do. I think I got time for one more question. Okay, I got more time than one more question. So I won't use it all on this question. But, Colonel, uh, I'd like to follow up a little bit, if we could, on the uh, 22 cities comment that you made, and specifically uh, this Meet Your Army initiative is a function of uh, uh, the volunteer military depends on people signing up. But what we find is that for all the services, uh, uh, because so few have served, many people that are eligible don't even understand what's available to them. Uh, they don't know anybody that uh, serves themselves or whatever. Uh, so uh, could you talk to us a little bit about uh, this, uh, what I, I characterize it as an unintended consequence of the all-volunteer force, and that is because so few have served, a lot of young people don't know about it. And the premise, of course, is if you know about us, just sort of like Rotarians that know you as a fellow member, you'll find out we're a lot like you and there are some things there worth sure. considering. Thanks. Yeah, so um, when you look, the reason Seattle is one of the top 22 cities, and those 22 cities are cities that were identified by the Army where we don't have a very large uh, recruiting population that comes in. Frankly, most of them come from the South. A lot of our, our recruits come from the South, which is traditionally a, a place where we've had good recruiting uh, efforts. And so what the Army has done is said, look, you know, how do we get the exposure to the Army farther out uh, into areas that we're not, um, currently, uh, you know, have a good presence in. And that's what Jimmy's talked about, these 22 cities. Uh, and, you know, what I tell people, they say, well, why should we go out and, and have someone join? My son was going to, you know, I think my son, right, he's going to join ROTC. He said, I don't want to be in the Army. It's like, okay, do what you want to do. But if you do want to be in the Army, here's what we offer to you. And it, it gets back to these things that we talk about, you know. Uh, you want to get a guy that's tied to a profession, whether it's the Army, the Navy, Air Force, Marines, or Coast Guard. We are a profession. We're not a, you know, we're not a club, a business. We are a profession, and that's how we treat it. And so we want to give, you talk about what a typical life cycle that soldier is. That soldier comes into our Army, 
And the first two or three months is looking at really just understanding what his or her job is. And jobs go from being an infantryman like me or being an intel professional, an engineer. Uh, you just met our new Rotar uh, Rotarian. His brother is the commanding general of Regional Health Command, Dennis Lamaster. I, uh, I serve with him every day. Medical professionals. So you look at a guy that comes in two years, we want him to already have started to get his college education. So there's a developmental process, whether they stay in three or four or 35 years, that we want them to leave our army better than they came in. And that's part of our commitment. And so it gives great opportunities. Whether an uh, individual wants to serve his initial or her initial term of four years or stay in 35. And that's the last question I can 